uh, for the pastoral prayer that we've been having over the last couple of months. I know that many of you, or quite a number of you, have been coming up and sharing prayers. And this morning, Sylvia is going to come. And Sylvia, for those of you who don't know who Sylvia come on up, Sylvia. For those of you who don't know who Sylvia is, she's one of the um, mission staff that we support, one of our local mission staff. And uh, so uh, some of what we give in our offerings goes to support our mission and goes to support Sylvia and the work that she does uh, here. And so welcome, Sylvia. Come and lead us in prayer. Good morning, church. My name is Sylvia Yuan. Um, I started coming to North Coast Baptist Church since 1996. Let's bow our head and pray. Almighty God, you bless us to be a blessing to all nations. We give you praise for your abundant mercy and grace we receive. We thank you for your faithfulness, even though we are often un unfaithful to you. Father God, we know that sometimes you put a thorn in our flesh for our own good. Our prayer is that you will heal everything that has caused stress, grief, and sorrow in our lives. Lord Jesus, we ask you to give us peace in our mind, body, soul, and spirit. Guide our path through life. Let your peace reign in our family, at our workplace, businesses, and everything we lay our hands on. Father God, as we enter winter, our thoughts are with those who are homeless and sleep rough. Lord, have mercy on those who find streets are safer than their homes in emergency housing. Help them to know that the creator of the universe has always been with the poor and the vulnerable. Give us wisdom and understanding to those who minister to them. Open our eyes to see the needs around us. Open our ears to the 160 languages that are spoken in this country. Lord, we remember all those who have lost their livelihoods in the flooding in Canterbury. We pray that they would receive enough support to pick up their lives again. Oh, Father God, help us to remember the people in India for, from the safety and comfort of New Zealand. For the sake of the missionaries and the Christians that are witnessing in that vast country, your mercy will extend to those who are yet to know you. May the Holy Spirit be with all those who are suffering and struggling at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is my first time uh, back to preach uh, among you for uh, about nine or ten weeks, and I'm going to do something spontaneous now, and I haven't actually asked them, but I'm sure they won't mind. I wonder if the elders might, would, would like to come up. It's, it's a little selfish of me, I know, but I wonder if the elders would come up and pray for me as I preach to you. Would you be happy for them to do that? Um, and they can pray for you as you hear what I'm going to share with you th this morning. So a couple of the elders maybe come on up and Love to have some prayer from you. You know, I've been preaching now for oh, 30, 35 years, I suppose, but it doesn't, you know, and it, it, it's still, you still have that same kind of, every time you get up, you really want to be sharing uh, what, what God's given you. And so uh, would you join us in prayer as, as they pray for me? Thanks. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, give you thanks for Bruce and for his uh, safe return and for the time he's had away. But Lord, we know it's been a special blessing and uh, he's come back refreshed and uh, spiritually refreshed, ready to sort of preach to us and teach us this morning. We just pray for his message. We ask that uh, it will touch our hearts and it will touch our minds in ways that enable us to glorify your son. <coughs> we uh, give you thanks for him and for all that he does for this church. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, how good it is to have Bruce um, back with us, Father. And we just thank you that uh, you will continue to speak through him. And Lord, may he very clearly hear your thoughts, your words, your direction, Father, even as he's talking. And Lord, I thank you for his heart, uh, for his love for our community. And Lord, I just pray that he will be able to speak 
speak your truth into our lives today. And Father, that we might be open to hear it. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts, that we Mm. would be attentive to what you would be teaching us today, Mm. I pray, Lord. Mm. Mm. Amen. Amen. Yes, we thank you, Lord, that we've got Bruce back. Thank you that he's had this these um, weeks of time just to um, rest, to have a change of scene, to um, just take time to just consider and think and read and all those things. Thank you that he's come back refreshed and we just pray that you just bless him and guide him as he gets back into the serious role of he's here back at NBC and um, just guide him, continue to encourage and um, just make it clear, um, you know, the direction that he, you know, can direct the church in. So, um, also we just remember all of us as a congregation and family here at NBC to continue to pray for him as well, um, support him in all ways that we can. And so we thank you for him and ask your blessings be on him, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank, you. thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Oh, thank you, elders. Well, yes, I have, I have come back um, refreshed and filled up uh, and, uh, dare I say it, a little worn out from a bit too much physical exercise. Uh, we love e-biking, as some of you know, and uh, we took our e-bikes with us down to the South Island and did a number of the uh, New Zealand cycle trails known as the Great Rides. In fact, we did about 850 kilometres on our bikes over seven of the uh, great cycle trails and enjoyed some of the incredible scenery of the South Island. And we also did a number of, of walks. Our greatest achievement, I think, was, the, was Roy's Peak uh, in Wanaka. Anyone done Roy's Peak in Wanaka? Oh, a couple of you have, yeah. If you haven't done it, maybe you should get down there and do it sometime. It's a pretty tough walk. It's seven kilometers, literally uphill. There's like no breaks. It's just up, 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 all the way, seven Ks. Uh, but it's worth it. I mean, the, the, the view from the top is just something else. It's one of those famous kind of Instagram uh, shots these days. You look at Instagram and there's all these people that, that have been up Roy's Peak. One of the loveliest moments we had was attending a church service in the Church of the Good Shepherd. Anyone been there? Tekapo? Many of you have, I'm sure. Uh, there it is there. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it's a very popular tourist destination, actually, isn't it, um, the Church of the Good Shepherd? It's usually crowded with tourists and tourist buses. But as you can see in that photo, there's not one single person there. Uh, there's hardly anyone around the South Island at the moment just because of the, uh, you know, the international tourists are not here. And the church is not actually open to, to viewing anymore. Uh, you can't go inside it, but... Uh, we happen to be there on a Sunday, and on Sundays they run a, a service, a church service in the afternoons at four o'clock. And we were there on a weekend, so we went along to the service. And about 15 or 20 of us gathered there in that tiny little church, people from, from all over New Zealand and around the world, and uh, from different church backgrounds. And there was that, that backdrop of Lake Tekapo uh, and the mountains. This little group of us worshipped together. We worshipped and we prayed and we shared communion. And there was just a lovely sense of, of family about us there for that hour or so. Even though we didn't know each other, we were from so many different churches and backgrounds and, and places, but we were family there for that time. That was one of the highlights. After the service, as I was walking out, hearing someone behind me call out, Bruce, Bruce. There amongst those 15 or 20 people were some people from Te Awamutu, of course. I, and I'd been there and served for 15 years at Te Awamutu Baptist. And they were from Te Awamutu Presbyterian Church. But they heard me pray out loud during that service, and they recognized my voice. And so we had a lovely catch up with them. Uh, Lovely moments that we experienced uh, in our time away. So again, thank you for the opportunity that you as a church gave me to have some time out. I'm sure the church hardly skipped a beat in my absence. 
talking about skipping a beat, 22 days after you were conceived, I don't know if you realize this, but 22 days after you were conceived was a very special day in your life. Anyone remember that day? 22 days after you were conceived was one of the most significant days in your life. 22 days after you were conceived, a tiny electrical pulse stimulated the muscle in here, a little muscle called the heart. And this little electrical pulse, which is technically known as an atrial kick, caused your heart to contract and forced blood into your ventricles for the very first time. That movement was so faint that it can hardly even be detected, but it was, in fact, the very first beat of your heart. And from that day to this, it's never stopped. Since that very first beat at 22 days old, your heart continues to beat. It has continued to beat around 70 times a minute. Except maybe when you first fell in love. Anyone here remember that moment? Maybe your heart went a little faster than 70 times a minute. Or maybe your heart skipped a few beats. So 70 times a minute, imagine that. That means we have over 100,000 heartbeats every day. That's over 36 million heartbeats every year. And if you live to be 80 years old, that's nearly 3 billion heartbeats during your lifetime. Some of you here are well over 80. You're approaching probably 4 billion heartbeats. Now clench your fist for a moment. Just clench your fist and look at your clenched fist. Don't go thinking about knocking anyone out the next, sitting next to you. Look at your fist. That is about the size of your heart. Now, I'm not a medical uh, specialist in any way, but I think that's right. Any doctors here today? No. Okay, well, I'm pretty sure that's about the size of your heart. Your heart is like a pump. It's going like this, pumping, pumping, pumping blood around your body. 70 mils of blood with every contraction. 15 to 20 liters of blood every minute. More than 25,000 liters a day that your heart is pumping. About a million barrels over an average lifetime. That's enough to fill more than three super tankers. 100,000 beats of your heart every day from, this one day from that first day to this. Makes you tired just thinking about it, doesn't it? No, no wonder some of us get tired sometimes. That muscle going all the time like this inside us. But you know the incredible thing? The incredible thing is our, our hearts never seem to forget that they have to keep beating. Imagine if our hearts only beat if we remember to tell them to do it. We'd be in serious trouble, wouldn't we? But they don't. We don't have to remember to tell our heart to pump. They just go on pumping. They just go on beating. Boom, 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 like that. Whether we're aware of it or not, it's a wonderful, wonderful gift, isn't it, from our Heavenly Father. Put this pump inside us that just keeps us going. But you know, God didn't just give us a, a physical heart. God gave you and me another kind of heart, a spiritual heart. There's an inner me, an inner you, an inner heart, that part of you that chooses that part of you that commits, that part of you that loves, that part of you that wills. It's not a physical heart, it's a spiritual heart. And friends, the truth of the matter is that one day your physical heart is going to stop pumping. It's just going to stop. 
One day it will stop beating. But your spiritual heart, the core of who you really are, friends, that heart will go on forever. And that's why the writer of the, Pro- of the book of Proverbs wrote this verse. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Above all else, more than anything else in your life, your number one top priority, the number one thing you ought to do, you need to do, is to guard your heart. Don't worry so much, the writer of Proverbs says, about how you're doing in terms of security and physical health and material wealth and all that stuff. That all has its place. It's important. But above all that, the top of your list, your first priority is to look after your heart. Care for your heart. Watch your heart. Because your whole life flows out of your spiritual heart. It's the wellspring of life. And so this morning I want to ask you a question in this new series that we're starting today. And the question is, how's my heart? How's my heart? What sort of condition is my heart in? My heart for God, my heart for people, my spiritual heart. How is my heart right now? I called this series Matters of the Heart because, well, we're dealing with matters of the heart. So it's a great title. We're going to talk about real important things in our lives. I'm using some resources from favorite author, John Ortberg, and some other books that I'll quote from time to time, and we're going to look at what the Bible says about our hearts. You know, the Bible speaks in so many places about our hearts. In fact, over 700 times the Bible uses this word heart. The book of Psalms alone has it more than 125 times. If the Bible uses this word heart and focuses on it so much, then it must be an important word. So let's do some thinking about our hearts in this series. As a kind of introduction to the series, I want to ask you a question this morning. This question, how's your heart? We're going to do a bit of a, a heart checkup today. Anyone been for a heart checkup recently? John probably has. Anyone else? A few of you have? Yep, heart checkups are good. Anyone been to the doctor recently? You don't have to own up. You don't have to put your hand up if you don't want What happens when you go to the doctor? You usually go for a purpose, don't you? Because there's something going on. And the doctor will, uh, he or she will ask you questions to kind of find out just exactly what's going on. How are you feeling? Where does it hurt? How long has it been hurting? You felt dizzy or faint? You know, are you taking medication? All, All sorts of questions that the doctor will ask you to kind of ascertain what's going on. Sometimes they're very personal questions, aren't they? Like, you know, are you going regularly to the loo? And all those sort of questions. And the idea that he's asking questions to kind of uh, work out exactly what's going on, to ascertain how you are, to make a diagnosis. Well, this morning and next week as well, actually, I'm going to do that as well. We're going to ask, I'm going to ask you some questions, personal questions. You don't have to give me the answers. You can just answer them for yourself. To try and work out how your heart is. To kind of do a a bit of a self-diagnosis. To kind of ascertain for yourself how you're doing. These questions will be a guide to help answer the big question. How's my heart? My spiritual heart? You see, we can be very subjective, can't we, sometimes? People say, how are you doing? And, uh, you know, you, you say, well, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay, I guess. Uh, but we need some kind of measure to work out exactly whether we are okay or not. So here we go. We've only got time for two this morning, and then next week maybe a couple more. 
So my first question this morning is, how's my first four, if I can get it up, there we go, how's my thirst for God? Am I thirsty? Am I thirsty for God? Am I more thirsty for God than I was, say, a year ago or or two years ago? Am I more thirsty for God than I was maybe looking back five years ago? It's a good question, isn't it? How's my thirst? What does it mean to be thirsty for God? Well, Psalm 42 actually gives us uh, 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 this wonderful statement about thirsting for God. It's a verse that, that many of us know very well. As a deer longs the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for the living God. I wonder if you can identify with that, that, that kind of statement from the Psalms. As a deer pants for streams of water. We all know that. Many of us know that song, don't we? We know it from the song. As a deer pants for water, so my soul longs after you. So friends, how's your thirst? Are you thirsty? Have you got a desire for more of God? Desire to know God more? Or are you just satisfied with where things are at right now? I've got a prayer book that I use sometimes in my personal devotional times. It's called A Diary of Private Prayer, written by a man called John Bailey. I don't know about you, but sometimes I struggle with prayer. I find it hard to pray. Sometimes I find it hard to know what to pray. And so using a prayer devotional book is really helpful sometimes for me. Perhaps you're all wonderful prayers. You don't have that problem. But I know that I do. I'm, sh- I'm sure that many of you do actually as well. So I find having a prayer book like this helps me sometimes to focus on my, my specific thoughts. And there's a lovely line in, in one of the prayers in this book that speaks of having this sense of restlessness, a sense of discontent with how things are now. This is the line in the prayer. For my restless heart, which nothing finite can satisfy, I give you thanks, O God. For my restless heart, which nothing finite can satisfy, I give you thanks, O God. It's actually a quote from St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers. He wrote, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Do you have a restless heart? Do you have this heart that's kind of not satisfied with how things are right now? Having a restless heart is not a bad thing to have. A restless heart, a sense of wanting more, a sense of not being happy with how things are in my heart right now, a sense of discontent with how things are in my relationship with God, a sense of wanting more. Jesus spoke about this too, didn't he? He said, said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness who thirst for a right relationship with God, for they will be filled. Jesus said, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty for more of God? If you're thirsty, if you want more, then you will be filled. God will give you more. One of the marks of a healthy heart is this growing hunger and thirst for more of God, not just being satisfied with where things are right now. So how are you doing on that one? Don't answer me, but answer answer yourself. How is your heart? Are you thirsty? Do you have a restless heart? Are you thirsty for more of God? Second question I want to ask this morning is, am I seeing any growth? Am I seeing any growth? Am I creating the right uh, environment for a healthy heart? How's the environment in my heart, around my heart? Is it an environment that creates growth? 
I want to deal with this one a little later in the series when we look at a parable that Jesus told about seed and soil. And in that parable, Jesus is really talking about the condition of our hearts. And so we'll have a look at some more detail at that parable and, and talk about heart conditions a little later in the series. You know, for growth to occur, whether it be my heart, my relationship with God, whether it be a plant or whatever it is, in order for growth to take place, it needs the right conditions, the right environment. The environment is critical to growth. If a plant's going to grow, it needs the right conditions, needs the right amount of water, the right amount of sunshine, the right amount of nutrients. In other words, the environment is critical for growth. Driving through the South Island, especially in the Canterbury area, we were just there a few weeks ago, we were amazed at how dry it is, or, or how dry it was. We, uh, we kind of missed that bad weather. Just how dry that whole Canterbury Basin is. Riverbeds just dried up. Canterbury Blaine, uh, Plains just dry and barren and dusty and a little growth. But then as you're driving along, you, you come across patches of green, just bright green in the middle of all this dry and dusty barrenness. And then you see why. You see these huge irrigation sprinklers. You seen those? They're amazing. Irrigation sprinklers. Apparently they're called center, per, uh, center pivot irrigators. And they're like, if you've seen them, they're like giant Lego. Or uh, 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 if you're old, as old as I am, Meccano. Remember Meccano? Giant Meccano piece. And there's this massive sprinkler and it's hundreds of meters long. And it's on wheels, and it's, uh, it, it, it just kind of swings around slowly um, for hundreds of meters uh, over a number of paddocks. And of course, all, these, all the paddocks that are uh, getting sprink, uh, watered like this are all green and lush, and beyond them is just dry and barrenness. In order for growth to occur, you've got to get the conditions right. How important the environment is for growth. My dad has had his uh, fair share of heart problems over the years. I'll share some more about, uh, about, about that in another part of our series. But my dad had his first heart attack when he was in his 40s. And my dad recognized at that time, actually so did my mom, and she was kind of the key person behind all this. Uh, he had to make some changes in his life in order for his heart to get healthy again. My dad had to create the right environment for his physical heart in order for it to get healthy again. He had to give up smoking. Fortunately, he'd done that a few years earlier. His diet had to change. His diet had to change dramatically, actually. Uh, he had to exercise more. His heart would not become healthy again unless he was intentional about some changes in his environment. And he did that. And now, close to 50 years later, my dad's heart is still pumping strong. Isn't that amazing? He had a heart attack, changed his environment, got it healthy, and growth occurred. The question is, am I creating the right environment for a healthy heart? If our spiritual hearts are going to grow, we need to give them the right environment. Listen, people, if you want to grow spiritually, you're going to have to be intentional about it. Good spiritual health won't just occur. Growth doesn't just occur happen. Your heart won't just be okay without you being intentional about it. I can't make your heart grow. No one else can make your heart grow. Only you can set up the right environment for your heart to grow healthy. 
One great place to start is to meet regularly with other followers of Jesus, where you can journey together, where you can pray together, where you can study the Bible together, a place where you can share your struggles and your your encouragements, a place where you can be supported, but you can support others. See, the Christian journey was never meant to be journeyed alone. We can meet here on Sunday, but we need also to have people that we gather with, where we can share our journeys with. We have lots of groups in our church where where many of you are meeting regularly. We call them home groups. Many of you are in one, but if you're not in one, we'd love to help you get in one. We'd love to help you get started. We'd, We'd love to have some more leaders to lead little groups to help people in their journeys. You've got to create the environment, friends, if you want your heart to get healthy and and you want to grow spiritually. Another part of the environment to create a healthy heart is to find a place to serve. Rather than just serving yourself and your own needs, one of the best things you can do to create a healthy heart is to look for ways of serving others. Serve others. This, friends, is not a new concept. It's not difficult to understand. Jesus understood this concept. Even Jesus, the king of the universe. He says, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. If it's good enough for Jesus, then it's good enough for us. Serving others, when we serve others, it creates this good environment for our hearts to grow, for us to get spiritually healthy. No one else can create that environment for you. You have to take the initiative yourself. Believe me, friends, the culture we live in isn't going to give you the kind of environment that you need. If you do nothing, you'll just drift further and further away from God. So where are you on this one? It's a critical one for you. Am I seeing any growth in my life? Am I restless for God? Am I wanting more? Am I seeing growth? Am I creating a good environment for growth? How's my serve? Am I serving others more than just serving myself? If we're honest, I suspect that most of us might not be that comfortable with the answers that we give ourselves. Perhaps we're doing reasonably well Perhaps we're reasonably thirsty for God, but maybe we're not serving as much as we know we could. Perhaps we're serving, but we're not really very restless in our sense of wanting more from God. You know, for most of us, change doesn't happen quickly. Growth doesn't happen quickly, does it? it? And, And you see that mostly in nature, growth doesn't happen quickly. It's a slow process. But the important thing is the direction you're going, not the speed. Good growth doesn't happen quickly, but get the environment right and growth will take place. So the big question is this, which direction are you heading? Are you moving toward God, toward Christ, or are you just drifting? Are you doing something about your spiritual health? Or are you just drifting along, hoping that something might happen? Once read a story about one of the early explorers of the Arctic who was leading his party across the ice, stopping every half hour or so to check his navigation instruments to make sure they were staying on course. He was sure they were heading north toward the pole, but the more they uh, walked, the more the instruments insisted that they were going south instead. He finally tried turning the expedition around and marched them off in the opposite direction. But it didn't matter which way they walked, every time he stopped, stopped to check his instruments again, they were even further south than they were before. He eventually figured out what was going on. 
the ice they were walking on had broken away from the main ice cap and had become this gigantic iceberg. And while they'd been walking north, the iceberg they were walking on was drifting south. And so even though they thought they were walking closer and closer to the pole, in fact, the iceberg was taking them further and further away. Friends, if you want to get closer to God, if you want to have a healthy heart, you need to do some diagnosis. You need to make sure that you are heading toward Him and not just drifting further and further away. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the great wisdom of that proverb that reminds us, that tells us, that instructs us above all else Guard our hearts. Lord, if we're honest this morning, many of us would say, actually, we're not doing that good a job at guarding our hearts. Lord, I pray this morning that you would put a thirst in us, a thirst in us for more of you, a sense of unsettledness in us, a sense of restlessness in us, that we might desire more of you. God, this morning, we know that the only way things will change is if we take initiative. Lord, I pray that you might put it on, on, on our hearts to take some initiative in our own lives to make the environment right. Whatever that might look like for us. Lord, just I pray that you would just impress something on us this morning and keep reminding us about that. Keep bringing it back to our minds. Maybe it's stepping into to, to help serve in some way. Maybe it's picking up our Bible and reading it a bit more often. Maybe it's praying a little more often. Maybe it's uh, joining up with a small group, whatever it might be, Lord. But impress that upon us and, and keep reminding us and don't let go. Lord, I pray that we might be responsive to you. Because, Lord, we want to have healthy hearts. Because we know our hearts are the wellspring of life. Lord, we want hearts that are healthy and well. And so, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit might continue to work in us and on us. Lord, give us courage today in our own lives to answer that question honestly. How's my heart? And Lord, if we're not happy with the answer, that we might do something about it. God, we offer ourselves to you again. Have your way with us, I pray. Amen. That song, such a well-known song, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. It's had a little bit of a renaissance, that song, actually, and um, a number of um, a number of groups have have brought a new release of it. This morning we're going to just sit and listen to the song, um, and you're, you're welcome to sing along if you'd like to hum along. I'm sure many of you know the song. It's going to be played on a video, uh, but just use this these uh, few minutes to re kind of reflect on your own life. Maybe make this your prayer: as a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Um, as I say, just. Uh, feel free to sing along to it. You can remain seated. Uh, and let's just allow the Spirit to speak to us through the song now. Stop. 
the water so my soul long to thee you are my heart desire and I Oh, I long to 